and we've got food and snacks. And even though like until we had a bathroom up and running, people were pooping out in the woods and there's no hot showers, we're doing what we can to provide like a pretty nice environment for our buddies. And so it was fun for them. They would come out and they would be giving us, you know, labor, but it was a really enjoyable build. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 271 with Jeff Waldman. Jeff is a builder, a tinkerer, a designer, and over the course of several years, he and his partner, Molly, designed and built a beautiful retreat in the Redwoods with lots of help from friends. And unfortunately, it was lost in a 2020 wildfire. In this conversation, we will talk about the benefits of building with your community and involving your friends in your builds, and also how to do that so that it actually helps you rather than slows you down. We also talk about the importance and how to just get started on something small, maybe not starting with a tiny house first, but with a chicken coop or a picnic table. Jeff is something of an expert on tools. He's written a best-selling book called Tools, The Ultimate Guide, and we talk about why he wrote it and who it's for. I really enjoyed this conversation with Jeff, and I know you will too. I hope you stick around. I love to cook in my tiny house kitchen, but I don't always love to clean up. And one of my big concerns with going tiny was losing the convenience of a dishwasher. That's why I'm so excited to share today's sponsor with you, the Fotile 2-in-1 in-sink dishwasher. It's a dishwasher built into a sink and it's perfect for tiny house living. This innovative appliance is perfect for modern living in compact spaces. With its efficient design, it saves lower cabinet space and fits perfectly into a standard 36-inch cabinet base, making it ideal for tiny homes. But it's not just about saving space, it's about saving time and water too. The Fotile 2-in-1 in-sink dishwasher offers a quick wash cycle of just 20 minutes, getting your dishes clean in no time. 45-minute standard and 80-minute intensive washes are also available. Plus, it saves nearly 50% of the water a regular dishwasher would consume. With its ergonomic top-loading design, you don't need to bend over like you would with a traditional dishwasher, making it perfect for small kitchens. When it comes to cleanliness, the Fotile 2-in-1 in-sink dishwasher doesn't disappoint. With five standard washing and rinsing cycles and a 360-degree cleaning system, it eliminates 99.99% of E. coli and other common bacteria from your dishes, promoting a healthy kitchen environment. Are you worried about installation? Don't be. Fotile provides a comprehensive DIY installation tutorial online, and they are offering Tiny House Lifestyle podcast listeners a special extended five-year limited warranty. There are over 30 million families around the world enjoying Fotile's full range of cooktops, ovens, range hoods, and in-sink dishwashers. They've channeled 20 years of experience and expertise into these innovative compact dishwashers. This amazing dishwasher has a rating of 4.7 out of 5 on Lowe's.com. Visit us.fotileglobal.com slash THLP to learn more and purchase your Fotile 2-in-1 in-sink dishwasher today. That's us.fotileglobal.com slash THLP. That link will be in the show notes too. Upgrade your tiny home kitchen with Fotile and experience the convenience of modern living in a compact space. All right, I am here with Jeff Waldman. No relation as far as I know. Jeff is a designer, builder, and author of books on tools. He sells building plans and has a newsletter where he writes about both construction and community building and where those two practices intersect for him. His property in California's Santa Cruz Mountains burned in the wildfires of 2020, but lives on as a canvas for new projects. Jeff Waldman, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Are we sure that we're not related? No, we haven't we haven't played this game yet. It's it's quite possible. <laughs> it's, uh, most of my Waldman lineage, I think, is uh, all West Coast. If that okay. it down. Yeah, I think mine's all East Coast. So all right, so we have to go back a few generations. Yeah, some some pioneers. Yeah, <laughs> um, some some German European pioneers. Um, so I, I first kind of. 
I watched a video tour. It's kind of a montage of of you and it looks like lots of friends building this just incredible little cabin in the redwoods. And it was on like my, you know, invite this person onto the show list. It somehow <laughs> fell off my radar because this is years ago, obviously at this point. Yeah. But it, it kind of resurfaced for me and I just I rewatched the video and I was like, I gotta get I gotta get Jeff on the show because this this project is so just sweet and and um there was something about it that just made me want to be there. Yeah. Um but I guess maybe you could start with like telling us a little bit more about about you and just kind of your background in, in building in general. Sure. Well, first just to mention, I guess, I think the reason that part of the part of the reason that that video kind of struck a chord with you and does with a lot of people is um, just a big communal aspect to it. So, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of friends having a good time. And I think that just resonates for a lot of folks. And it's why, you know, in the intro you're talking about on my newsletter, there was stuff that I tend to write about is like that intersection of community building and doing projects because it's just more fun with friends. But I'll get around to kind of that and the ethos of the property, I guess, in a bit. But uh, yeah, so for me, I don't know, I'm 41 years old now. Mm-hmm. I've always built a little bit, you know, like skate park as a kid, dirt jumps out in the field, you know, fort or whatever. But I mean, nothing all that professional. I was more like the guy that, you know, if your kitchen sink was broken and we were friends, mm-hmm. you might call me over to help you fix it. And not because I know anything about kitchen sinks, but you're like, I don't know, maybe you can figure it out. Mm-hmm. I had that kind of scrappy, I'll pick up various skills kind of attitude. And then, yeah, into adulthood, I just started making things a little bit more and more, but really just um, in my apartment, you know, little projects, small Mm -hmm. woodworking. I went and did a timber framing workshop out in New York, actually, in 2015, that I think was pretty formative. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, it was, I can't remember if it was right before that workshop or right after, but uh, my partner Molly and I, who have been together for 13 years now, we've been living in San Francisco and we were just kind of ready to leave our apartment for more space. You know, we were really mm-hmm. craving like house, yard, projects, build a thing. Mm-hmm. And we just couldn't get that in the city. So we thought about leaving. I mean, we considered moving to um, New England a little bit. Mm-hmm. We talked about, uh, you know, what about around the Great Lakes? She's got family in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We looked at the Pacific Northwest. I think we actually took a trip up to Washington or Portland and looked around. But ultimately, we decided that our community around San Francisco and the Bay Area was just too strong. And if we really looked at why we were kind of happy and content in our day to day, it was the people. And Mm -hmm. we didn't want to, like, give that up so easily. So as a placeholder because we could not afford to buy a house with a yard and space and room for projects in San Francisco or even the area right around here. We bought some land in the Santa Cruz mountains, mm-hmm. which if you look on a map is a strip of land that's South of San Francisco near San Jose, near Santa Cruz, surprisingly wild and undeveloped. And if you go like dead center to the middle of it, where you're kind of the furthest away from the beach and from San Francisco, mm-hmm. you get into some land that's, it's not super affordable by um, U.S. standards, but it's mm-hmm. very affordable by San Francisco. By San Francisco standards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And especially if you do what we did. And this, I don't mind that this happened, but like the reason, part of the reason that our property burned is we bought what we could afford and what made sense at the time, mm-hmm. which was a scraggly bit of 10 acres of land on a, on a slope at the end of like, just the rowdiest of dirt roads really in the middle of nowhere. And mm-hmm. it's the exact type of thing that if a fire comes through is definitely going to burn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the people that can buy a, a big parcel that's sort of connected more to the mainland and the fire department knows about it and it's a nice flat defensible space. Yeah. That's a lot less likely. So we bought what we could, which was fine. And we did that with the intention of saying, okay, we're going to be here for a while. We're not going to get a house with a big yard, a big plot of land. And we're not going to you know, build something um, where we're living. Mm-hmm. This will serve as kind of our weekend getaway and the communal space that we've kind of always wanted to have with friends. It'll be a place and a reason to gather and somewhere that we can kind of 
exercise some you know creative muscles and design some things and build some things and just like have that yeah and so that's how it got its start that was uh september maybe a little bit earlier but 2016 okay and so you you started in on it in 2016 and you know the the video which which I'll definitely put in the show notes for this page so people can you know mm-hmm. we're it's a podcast so obviously you know it's a very visual thing you have to <laughs> you have to go and watch the video you know it 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 certainly seems to encompass a long time span because you go from chopping down trees at the at the beginning and then at the end you're seeing little clips of other structures like an outdoor bathhouse and a, you know, a pergola yeah. with a clear roof and all these different structures that, you know, certainly didn't sprout up overnight. Yeah. I'm well, on the one hand, so that video spans, let's see. 15, I mean, I don't even think that video spans three years. And oh, wow. so it's, it spans a, a certain amount of time for sure. But mm-hmm. also a lot of what you see, like, I think that video that I stitched together actually only had our cabin when the exterior was closed in. It didn't mm-hmm. include the finished interior. Mm-hmm. And we just went so hard and fast because we were very excited. We had a pretty big network of friends um, around here. Mm-hmm. But also people in the city are just really excited to work on projects, mm-hmm. to get their hands dirty, to get out into the woods, to build some stuff in some trees. Like It's yeah. very romantic. Yeah. And... Molly and I were very intentional about creating a space that felt welcoming and open. So we hit the ground running. And I mean, when, you know, the first projects that we did were like, uh, I don't know, a picnic table. I had to download Mm -hmm. some instructions off Instructables and I had to go out and buy a drill. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working real bare bones stuff. But, um, you know, the next weekend, another project and the next weekend, another project. We're making leaps and bounds kind of jumping off from what we were doing before mm-hmm. you know, as we're building that confidence and competence. And, and when we're doing it, we're inviting friends out. And something that I think she and I did really well is we would do a lot of project planning, making sure that the stage was set for um, having all your materials and making sure everything was going to go smoothly. There was no last minute runs to the hardware store and we've got food and snacks. And even though like, until we had a bathroom up and running, people would pooping out in the woods and there's right. no hot showers. Right. We're doing what we can to provide like a pretty nice environment for our buddies. Yeah. And so it was fun for them. They would come out and they would be giving us, you know, labor, but it was a really enjoyable build. And word of that was kind of spreading. So what yeah. started out as, you know, a half dozen friends who were eager to come quickly became a dozen and, you know, they would, tell their friends because it was just the it was the type of thing that really beckoned to a certain type of person Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think within a few years like our email invite list for when we were doing weekends out there was like 60 or 80 people or something it was really big wow wow you know it's just one of those like build it and they will come type things like if you're Uh doing cool shit out in the woods you Mm -hmm. might have folks come out to join you yep so Obviously, this is all like very exciting for us. And we've got people that are very interested in contributing. So we went pretty hard. And I mean, shower, outhouse, uh, the pavilion, a couple of little structures, a big part of the motivation and wanting to do something out in the woods Mm -hmm. is just like Ewok Village treehouse stuff. I love treehouses. Yeah. Love the elevation. Super exciting. So we started doing that. I was actually just today writing up a, a newsletter thing about the evolution of those projects in the trees. Mm-hmm. And I think it comes out in a couple of weeks, but you know, we started small, like a little platform, but that little platform is so exciting. Like you're still having yeah. dinner on it or you're sleeping on it because it's a thing and it didn't exist before. And we kind of kept evolving in that way. When we did our outhouse build, we'd never built a tiny structure before. You know, we'd read a lot about um, tiny homes and tiny cabins, uh, you know, both like, the quote unquote tiny homes on wheels and then just smaller structures. Mm -hmm. We'd read a lot about the theory of uh, home building, even at a small scale, but we've never done it. And we knew that we wanted to do a cabin at some point. So when we built our first outhouse, we tried to do it like really well, way better than you should ever build an outhouse. (laughs) We tried to make it as practice for like, okay, this is a, a house build just, you know, that's, it was, I think nine by nine feet or something. Yeah. 
which was great. And that baby step gave us enough confidence. We were like, okay, we're going to break ground on this cabin. Mm. And um, the cabin build, I think all told from groundbreaking to like the last bit of interior stuff was maybe a year. And okay. when I cut that video together that you saw, I think it was when we had finished the exterior closing mm-hmm. it in. And, mm-hmm. you know, that was a very exciting accomplishment. It was like, all right, no matter what happens on the inside of this, we have a shelter now. And right. And right. A big deal. Place to sleep inside, dry. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a good number of years elapsed in that video. But also, I th- when I look back at the record, as I was just doing today and putting together that post. Mm-hmm boy, did we do a lot in like three years time? Yeah. Just, you know, it was fun. Yeah. It, it's funny. Cause uh, you know, I, I built my tiny house now over 10 years ago. It was like a, it was a year and change back in 2012. And I remember I didn't have a lot of big group build days. I think there was maybe the biggest group I put together was I, I framed the subfloor assembly off of the trailer on the ground, which was, I'll never do that again. If I ever do another tiny house on wheels and it was, you know, 24 feet long and had sheet metal on the bottom. It was, it was quite heavy after it was all built and it was kind of floppy, you know, cause it's like, yeah, sub floor. So I, I kind of assembled a big crew of family and friends to, to help kind of pick the thing up and put it onto the trailer. But that, I remember that, that took like a good half day of planning you know, ordering the pizzas, making sure there were work gloves for everyone, all that stuff. And it strikes me that like, once you get into the swing of things of having people help you on projects, you can get a little bit faster with it. And it's almost like at some point the balance tips and it goes from being kind of like a pain in the butt to have someone help you. You're like, Oh, (laughs) is it actually help? Or is it going to be more work (laughs) for me to have you help me? Yeah. I mean, there's that old adage with, uh, like contractors, contractors where it's like, if you want to help, it costs extra. Right. You know? like, right. Yeah. Well, I think there's two ways to look at that. Mm-hmm. I do agree with you that if you flex that muscle more and you kind of get into the swing of things, you can figure out how to delegate and where yeah. like, more bodies can be helpful. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know, I work so well solo or just with another person. Mm-hmm. And so there it comes down a little bit to values so many of the projects we did were not necessarily because we really needed to have that structure. It was just an excuse to do a project with friends. Yeah. There was a a big tree deck that we put up that Mm -hmm. I just did because my friend Drew was coming into town and I wanted to work on a thing with him. Yeah. And you know, that was a reason to gather another half dozen folks and do it. Mm -hmm. I would it have gone like, did it go eight times faster because we had eight people? Mm Mm-hmm. Probably not. I mean, definitely a few hands on some big heavy beams helped a little bit, but yeah, I think for us, a big part of the experience has been, and hopefully will continue to be, the community aspect of it. I mean, when we did the wall raising for our cabin, I think there was like 30 people there. We yeah. definitely didn't need that many people to raise those walls. But <laughs> It was, you know, it, it, it felt fun. Yeah. So it's... I don't know. There's definitely two sides to that. Uh, Cause I mean, there also is, it's hard to delegate. That's a whole different thing. Managing an yeah. operation and figuring it out. I think that's what separates. I know a lot of very talented builders who work like crazy fast and well on their own. And it mm-hmm. just doesn't come intuitively to them and not always to me for yeah. how to really delegate tasks and make use of bodies. Yeah, totally. What I tried to do both to make it fun for our friends and also to kind of make things um, happen quickly and to respect like sort of the manpower and time they were giving me Mm -hmm. is I would show up for a project maybe a couple days in advance or both Mm -hmm. Molly and I would or something. Mm -hmm. And we would do all the foundational work, which might literally be putting down a foundation or laying out and marking wood or cutting it and, you know, marking it for how it's going to get laid out. Yeah. And when the day comes for assembly, it goes really fast and everybody has a really good time because they're basically just putting up Legos Mm. and it is making use of their manpower. And they're not all standing around while I'm like figuring out what the layout of the rafters are Mm -hmm. because they've already been cut. 
labeled like they're ready to rock and roll. Ready to go. Yeah. I also, I mean, and I think that this hasn't always been good for me. Part of the reason why so many of these builds have gone off as well as they have, as far as our friends could tell, mm-hmm. is because my mind's just like a little bit too obsessive. And I've been disassembling and reassembling that model in SketchUp a thousand times. I've been lying in bed awake at night, going through the process in my head. Like when we did the wall raising on the cabin, which Mm -hmm. was wall raising, rafters, loft beams, a temporary loft floor, the plywood over the top of the rafters. We did it all in a a day and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. And we did all that. And these are some really big pieces to move around on a very small site. Mm -hmm. I obsessed over that dance of like, what goes where, who does what, what piece do I need? Mm -hmm. In terms of like hours invested, it's not great. Like I'm I'm lying awake, it's costing me sleep, you know, but the payoff is on that weekend. Everybody's Mm -hmm. got a job to do. It goes off pretty well because there's almost nothing I didn't think of. And everybody's like, wow, that was really fun and amazing. Like, yeah, I mean, it only cost me six nights sleep, but it was good. (laughs) Yeah. That's like my superpowers being sort of um, broken and obsessive in that way. Well, it, it leads to some beautiful buildings <laughs> built with friends. Yeah, I suppose so. Would yeah. you, I mean, in putting that subfloor up with um, a handful yeah. of friends, yeah. like, do you find that experience rewarding? Were you like, I wish I could do stuff with people more often? Or was it too much of a hindrance for you? No, it wasn't. It wasn't a hindrance for me. Um and it was it was rewarding because, you know, in 2012, the idea of a tiny house on wheels was way more fringe than it is now, yeah. you know, and I was just happy that my parents and my girlfriend at the time, who's now, you know, now we've been married forever, like that they were in support of the project. But then having friends and family friends and other family members come and kind of lend a hand in a way made me feel supported by that whole group of people like oh all Mm. of these people believe in this vision of of a tiny house and so that's you know you're getting something there that's more than just a set of hands to help you lift something heavy yeah totally i mean they're showing their support in a a meaningful way instead of just saying it right yeah like someone brought a pickup truck to move you know we actually ended up picking the thing up and then they backed the trailer under where everyone was standing it feels like a very tangible connection to your community. Yeah. I think the Amish are onto something with their barn raising. So well, I think that I was going to bring that up, which is that I think that for probably most of human history, building, uh, building shelter was a community endeavor. It's probably only in the last hundred years or 200 years that we've kind of outsourced the building of our homes to, and, and not been involved in it really. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, we've we definitely have lost that connection. Mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, the thing that I always point to whenever we build, we've only had the pleasure now of building a, a few things that you would call shelters, but a mm-hmm. lot of other stuff, decks, and you know, a lot of flat surface, which on, on, on our uh, hilly terrain is very prized. Yeah. And every time we've built something, flat, walled, whatever, mm-hmm we've had dinner on top of it with our friends that day with that's the friends awesome. that helped us build it. Yep. And yep. I don't know that that's a, that's an old world community connection. Like yep. the folks that you're close to helping you build the thing that you're going to live in and then sharing a meal on it. Yep. It's a very specific and special kind of reward that I just, I don't get from like getting together with friends for a coffee or a lunch date or whatever, you know, it's, yeah. um, it's yeah. much more impactful. Yeah. Do you get, um, having been involved with teaching, you said you were teaching some tiny house workshops with Yeah, I've, I've done some teaching with Yes Tomorrow, and then I also teach my own courses through, you know, online, and yeah. I, I do a lot of teaching, yeah. Do you feel like there's community building that emerges from that, since folks are kind of sharing over that labor? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I know that people, I've seen it at Yes Tomorrow, students become really close and and i i think keep in touch and then maybe end up even helping each other out on their tiny house builds yeah i mean yes tomorrow is cool because they you know they they have for at least for the tiny house courses they they'll have a client so you're building a tiny house for someone and oftentimes 
the both times that I did it, the client was somebody who had previously taken the course hmm. and they were now kind of returning as the client and letting other students kind of build their tiny house. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like those, um, those types of uh, workshop relationships, they remind me of like camp friends. Yeah. You, know, you, totally. just, you get, you get very intimate, very quick, like working alongside somebody. Yep. Absolutely. That's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I've done some timber framing workshops mm -hmm. and then just a, a, a variety of like other workshops. And I've yeah. always found them to be very connected in that way. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, you mentioned that you are going to be writing about, you know, the value of going to workshops, but also in our correspondence, you know, before the interview, you kind of mentioned that, you know, starting small, you know, as you said, with like building a picnic table, I think I built yeah. a chicken coop with my dad before I built the tiny house. Um, but, but that workshops are a great way to connect people, put their hands on a project or, or get some skills. Can you, can you speak more to that? Sure. Try and tie in both those things actually. So I, I sell some building plans online mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mostly from projects from our property and a few other things. And, yep. You know, folks reach out all the time talking, usually big dreams of like, I want to build this cabin or, you know, I'm afraid to build this cabin. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm always advocating for is just like build something, mm -hmm. start tiny. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Don't get bogged down under the weight of like some big project. That's probably never going to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. Learn by doing and just, you know, figure it out on something small and, and build from there. So start on yep. a picnic table, get a little bigger, build a bench, whatever it is, a chicken coop. And yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for all of the little ancillary um, skills that you build just by getting comfortable with that process and with tools and stuff. And I've seen that in workshops. Yeah. My friend Tom teaches some timber framing workshops. Since I met him when he was instructing a timber framing workshop and I've helped him on several cents. Mm -hmm. And timber framing is pretty niche. Most of the people that have taken those workshops are never going to do any timber framing again for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. But I saw them benefiting immensely from just like, learning how to work on a job site, collaborate yeah. with others, figuring out how to measure, mark, saw, chisel, do so without cutting themselves. If there's a lot of capability that just sort of emerges in that setting. And so even if you're not necessarily going to, you know, go do timber framing afterwards, mm -hmm. now you might feel a little bit more emboldened as I was to go buy a few tools and try your hand at a picnic table or whatever it is. Right. I'm just such a big advocate of it because I think, especially in this internet age where inspiration is so readily available, mm -hmm. there's a lot that's inspiring. But when you start digging in on like, boy, I'd love to have this tiny house. Well, when you start reading about the proper way to build a roof or a structure oh or God. how to ventilate that roof or how to attach something to a trailer... And the more that you come to realize, the more you realize you don't know, mm -hmm. it just, it's such a bottomless well, the inability or the feeling that like to do this right feels uh, sort of inimaginably difficult. And so you just don't really do anything at all. Right. I think that that's really common. I think people have all kinds of stuff on Pinterest and they're never going to do it because it just feels like too much. But if you, you know, break ground on a chicken coop. Yep. All of a sudden, like the next iteration of that starts to feel a little bit more attainable. Totally. And with a tiny house too, it's like you do need to figure all that stuff out, but not all at the same time. Totally. And that's the problem, I think, when you're looking at a project from afar and yeah. it's feeling very daunting is yeah. you're figuring all that stuff out at once and you're like, this is too much. I mm -hmm. can't. And it's like, no, 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 you can just... I mean, when we started on our cabin, even though at that point we built up enough confidence to like figure that we could start on it. Yeah. I really only committed to putting down a foundation and joists and a subfloor because I was mm -hmm. like, if nothing else, we've got a yoga deck. Like that's it. So yeah. we'll, we'll, a platform you know, we'll, for tents to sleep a on. A platform for tents and then we'll see how the rest of this goes. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, I think that that's big. Yeah. Especially, you know, this is a podcast that's talking about tiny homes. It's not to say that they're, they're all cheap, but we're not talking about really big projects here. Like not only can you start small with other projects that you're uh, cutting your teeth on, but like mm -hmm. 
you can start down the baby steps of some sort of tiny house type thing. And it's not a monumentally like daunting financial prospect, right. you know, right. just like ease down that road a little bit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hopefully. Well, the, um, you know, we'll definitely link to elevated spaces. And so people can look at, at the different plans and different, different structures that, that you have plans for. They're, they're really beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Really nice designs. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm curious, you know, I want to kind of talk about the loss of all of this. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you've, it's clear that this was such a pivotal and meaningful experience for, for you and your partner and for your friends who, who kind of put all this time and love and energy into this project. Was it, was it in your head the whole time? Like, okay, if a wildfire comes through here, this would be in trouble or was it, you know, was that always in the back of your mind or was this kind of like a surprise? It was. And I I think my partner, Molly, I think she was a little bit bothered by how often I would mention it. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, you know, when the wildfire happens, just because wildfires have always been a problem in California mm-hmm. and especially over the past you know, decade or so, it seems like every wildfire season has been getting worse. Yep. Yep. And when you look around at the, the thick tinder that is our property and mm-hmm. the way that it's laid out, just unless you clear cut the entire mountainside. There's really no way to do a defensible space because you're on the slope and the trees are sort of looming over you from higher neighboring property. Yeah. And so it's just like, if a wildfire comes through here, boy, is this going to go. And even though we knew that and we were mm-hmm. accepting of the risks, because I don't want to minimize the amount of money that we've spent, but of course against like, I don't know, buying and building real houses, it was a fairly trivial amount. We were just, you know, we were accepting of the risk and the cost and the consequences. But at the same time, you still kind of think that it happens to somebody else, not you, you know? Yeah. So there's a a surrealness when it actually does occur. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's funny. The, the loss didn't hit me at first because mm-hmm. it was just stuff and it's just projects. And I get really excited about projects. I really want to see them through. I want to have the experience of creating a thing, conceiving of how it can be mm-hmm. put together, doing it with friends. Mm-hmm. And then I don't actually need to own it that much afterwards. So I, that okay. didn't bother me too much, the loss of that work. But the wildfire happened during COVID and things were just really getting shaken up around COVID. You had um, friends that were leaving the city. We're at an age where a number of our friends were having kids. People were just less sociable for various reasons. Wildfire happened. So our property as a social tool, as time went on, I was like, oh man, this really took a hit. Because mm-hmm. the truth is, uh, it's, we've rebuilt a little bit there, but um, it's, not, uh, it's just not what it was. You, know, right. you, you can't right. go back to like that really sweet time where you know, everything that we had there. Mm-hmm. So that's been a bit of a bummer. Uh, I've definitely lamented that. It was clearly a, a phase in time that was particularly sweet and you mm-hmm. can't quite go back to. Mm-hmm. The, the land itself has recovered pretty well. We've had to do a lot of work clearing trees that uh, either fell in the fires or in the storms afterwards or didn't quite get consumed and were just standing dead. And now like it's doing all right. Mm-hmm. We spent a couple of years without water. We finally got water back up and running because all of the infrastructure for that uh, burned. Yeah. And then we've built a couple of new structures. Um, we have an outhouse and a little tiny A-frame, and I think that's it. But um, both of those, the fire really informed their design, where it's like, okay, I'm willing to build something else here because... Really, I just uh, wanted to have a project. I wanted to design a thing and make it. But like, I'm only going to invest so much time and so much money into this. So whereas the first iteration of some of our stuff was like, how, how nice can we make this? Mm-hmm. And how much time can we spend on it making it oh so cool and perfect? 
the next ones were like, okay, what's the most cost effective way I can make something that's still fun and attractive, but is going to really not put me out financially or put us out, you know, too much time, which is a great design exercise. So we made this little tiny A-frame that is basically a hard walled tent. Mm -hmm. And we threw it up in a weekend with some friends. I think it cost $2,200 or something. Mm -hmm. Our outhouse was less than that. I think it was like 1500 bucks because I opted for some some siding that was a little bit nicer. Mm -hmm. But it too was, I think, a weekend or two project. So that's definitely changed the ethos of things a little bit. Yeah. I'm tempted. We've been, so we had a bunch of redwoods that came down and we milled them uh, with a chainsaw mill on the property. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about how to put that wood to use. And we've been tempted to do like a small cabin build where the old cabin stood. And there's that knowledge of like, this still isn't the type of property you can really defend against. There's still a chance that wildfire could come back through, you know, this is a fun design exercise and it's great to be able to build a thing and, um, to, you know, maybe inspire others or sell Mm -hmm. some plans or whatever, but how do you, how do you keep this like pretty minimal in terms of both effort and cost while still feeling satisfying? Mm -hmm. And so I haven't fully fleshed out a design for that yet. And I don't know if we'll ever do it, but yeah. Potentially, some of the redwood we willed, that's what we'll uh, kind of put towards. So yeah, it's, we still hang out there with friends, and friends borrow it now, especially now that um, it took a couple of years for it to be a more usable place. But now it's, it's a lot different than what it was, but mm-hmm. it's um, not a bad little retreat in nature. Nice. If you visited it now, having never been there before, you'd be like, this is great. And it's like, yeah, well, you think it, it used to be cool. different. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your current building projects? What are you What are you tinkering with right now? Um, that I mean, you know, been kicking around the the cabin design mm-hmm. and thinking about that more and more as we've been milling that wood. You know, what to do with it. Mm-hmm. I just got back. I was in Oregon for two and a half weeks helping my friend on a timber frame up there. Okay. I've got a shop in Oakland that I share with a couple friends, and I do a little bit of like uh, furniture stuff there. Not big, but, uh, you know, kind of small. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, sort of the extent of it right now uh, nice. in terms of building. And uh, I wanted to ask you about about your book that it looks like it, it was published about a year ago. It's called Tools, the Ultimate Guide, 500 Plus Tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I never really loved the subtitle, but I couldn't think of a better one. It, uh-huh. it feels a little bit pro wrestler flyer or monster truck flyer <laughs> the ultimate guide. ultimate guide but yeah it's basically a book that is trying to make a map of all the different tools out there and the ways that they kind of intersect mm-hmm. things that they share things that they don't i tried to write it in a way that would have a little bit of something for everybody so like if you're really familiar with tools you read through there and you're going to find some esoteric variations you've never heard of or some trivia or history or details where you're like, well, this is new to me. Right. But for the person who doesn't really know anything about it, my hope is that it kind of demystifies a lot of it. Because I think a big part of the problem when you're first getting started is you don't have a language around this sort of thing. Right. And so if you have a little bit of a roadmap that can start to plug those puzzle pieces together, right. it allows you to fill in the gaps more where you're like, okay, I'm starting to see it all now. Yep. Yep. And that was a fun project. It's, it's done decently well, better than I thought it would, but it was my COVID project, which was great. Everybody was lamenting like being locked down and not being able to do anything. And I was like happily typing away. So it was nice. perfect. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like you did quite a bit of research for this book. Yeah. 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 It was a two year process. Yeah. Start to finish, you know, a decent amount of the stuff I could write just from my head. Cause I know about the tools, but of mm-hmm. course a lot of research has to go into it. Right. I think I whittled it down to probably 40 something thousand words, but it started at like 70,000. There was, oh, wow. there was a lot in there, but, um, it was too dense. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I had to chip away at it. I think that it, it, it looks really cool. I'm actually, I'm going to pick up a copy and, and we have like a little library in our tiny house of, of tiny house books, Lloyd Kahn books yeah. and other building books. And I think it'll, it'll fit in nicely there. But 
Oh, I, just think I can't hold a candle to old Lloyd. Lloyd. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's kind of the, like the OG California, like just yeah. build something kind of guy. I, uh, I wish I, I feel very grateful that I have something of a relationship with Lloyd. I've, I, nice. I've met up at, with him at his place in Bolinas a few times, but nice. I, I wish that I knew him a little bit better. It's, I feel very privileged to even have met him. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. He's, I mean, he was writing books back when you needed the books. I mean, the, yeah. the truth is like mine, it was very fun to put together. It makes for a nice gift, but like all that stuff you can learn on YouTube, you know, <laughs> but it's when Lloyd true. was making a book, yeah. uh, you know, when he started, it was like, that was the resource or some yeah. of the resources for how to build certain things or what was out there. He told me that like, cause his first book was a geo, a, a book about building geodesic domes. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think it was the first interview I did with him where he was like, don't build one. They don't work. I don't recommend yeah. it, but like people still write in and he just sends them the book, like the manuscript yeah. of it. Cause like people still want to build it, but he's like, I won't sell it, but sure. If you, yeah. you want to go for it, go for it. He told me the same thing. He yeah. said, uh, yeah. he had a realization at some point that nothing in our lives were dome shaped. So it was sort of a bad fit. <laughs> it's like your bed's square, your, yep. you know, your yep. dresser's square. Yep. Nothing, nothing's square. round. Everything yeah. square. I do, I do think like it's so helpful to not have to watch a 20 minute YouTube video uh, with ads and like, you know, that's long sure. enough to fill YouTube's content, like guidelines, suggestions where you can say like, okay, I'm in the, I'm in the plier aisle at Home Depot and there's like, there's like 20 different kinds of pliers. There's, there's like locking pliers, there's vice grip pliers, there's like bent ones, straight ones. And it's just like, I could guess what these would be useful for, but it's also nice to know, like, this is a, like, yeah, totally. This is what this is called. And this is what it is used for. Yeah. 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 And I think if, you know, something that really informed how I was writing that book is once you have that baseline or somebody feeds you a few things, like yeah. now, you know, some of the words and the terminology, mm -hmm. now you can ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so often when people first start out, they don't even know what questions to ask because you don't know what the thing is called. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a real challenge when you're just designing and building stuff is trying to figure out what the name of the thing is you're looking for. And yep. once you figure out like a name or an adjacent name, it really unlocks like, Oh, now, now I know what to ask. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I mean, uh, it's, I, I think that there's a certain romantic quality to flipping through a book and looking for it. I just I acknowledge that, yeah. uh, you know, it's also all out there on the internet too, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everything is out there on the internet. It's true. Everything. Yeah. So when you, um, you know, approach designing something new, uh, are you, are you all sketch up or do you start, do you start with a drawing, you know, pencil and paper? I've been trying to do a little bit more drawing, but I am just terrible at drawing. Mm -hmm. And because I have to go through so many iterations, revising a thing, um, SketchUp has just proven for me to be the most valuable tool. Yeah, I, I'm really big on optimizing uh, materials and trying to minimize cuts and I th just, um, or minimize uh, the amount of work that's needed, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, especially... Part of it just comes from a place of wanting a job to flow well. But the other part is at this property we're at, it's fairly remote. Sometimes we could get things delivered or delivered close. Very mm -hmm. often we had to truck it all in and hand mm -hmm. carry it. So you're, you're really trying to think through exactly how much stuff you need. And I found SketchUp to just be the easiest way for me to kind of figure that out in detail. Yeah. And then when I'm planning how a build is going to go together, being able to examine all those little layers and connections and flesh yeah. them out in a way yeah. that I, I just really can't do with pen and paper. It's, it's proven for me to be a really instrumental tool. Okay. Cause you, you know, you're building a thing digitally and I might do it a dozen times or more before doing it in real life. I wish I could draw this. I have a, a friend who, um, kind of draws all of the stuff that he designs and mm -hmm. it just feels a little bit like a superpower to be able to whip out a, a pad and sketch what you need. Yeah. Cause I can do, you know, what I'm creating and SketchUp is arguably more useful, but boy, does it take me a lot more time to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it doesn't look as cool. The drawings <laughs> look, look fun. 
they do look fun, but then getting to peel back, you know, peel back the siding and show the framing plan is also a nice, a nice yeah. thing. Are you, uh, able to draw? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not great at drawing and I'm also really yeah. slow and not great at SketchUp either. So <laughs> yeah, Hobbled. I would, I don't even know that I'm great at SketchUp, but I, mm-hmm. I, I can use it and yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know being, when you look at, um, like the number of uh, iterations I might go through to arrive at a thing. Like, mm-hmm. Well, that would have been a lot of paper. So it's probably best that you're doing yeah. it digitally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, it's been so great catching up with you and, and chatting. I'm curious, was there anything that I didn't ask you about that you were, you were like feeling like you wanted to talk about? I don't think so. I think you've kind of covered everything. It was nice. a real pleasure talking with you. I appreciate Likewise. having me on. Well, one thing that I like to ask all my guests just as a closing question is just um, any favorite resources, books, or things that you'd like to share with our listeners. And, and you can't recommend your own book because I already did. I wouldn't recommend my own book anyway. It's all on <laughs> YouTube. I really enjoy A Pattern Language mm, as a book. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, you, you know the book? I do. I am familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I recommend that one to a, to a lot of folks. Nice. Yeah. SketchUp. Um, I mean, we just kind of talked about it, but they got rid of the free program that you could download. The 2017 version used to be free, but the web app is still free. And if you, I don't know if, if you don't know how to design or build a thing, boy, is it a good place to start just because there's a hurdle to getting over designing and navigating in 3d it's definitely Mm -hmm. not immediately intuitive if you've never Mm -hmm. done it but if you can get over that hurdle a little bit i feel like the ability to practice building that picnic table on your computer a dozen times before you go out and saw your first piece of wood is just monumentally helpful absolutely and workshops i wrote about it in my newsletter uh recently it's something i'm a big, big proponent of just skill building in general. I think taking workshops where you're, you know, most of us are, um, at least, you know, most people my age are past being in school. So Mm -hmm. being in a situation where you're kind of challenging yourself, uh, having to learn some new skills, work with some people that you don't know, yeah, getting to intimately know some people by working alongside them and perhaps building some new relationships with like-minded quality individuals is obviously nice. Yeah. And yeah, I, just, I think that it's an untapped resource because as much as people might say, I enjoy baseball or woodworking or pottery or plants or whatever it is that they consider to be their hobbies or their passions, they don't really think like, oh, for a fairly nominal fee in my city, I can, mm-hmm. you know, probably go out and engage in some extra adult curricular learning on this. So I think that it's a really cool resource and I'd like more people to look into them. Awesome. Well, Jeff Waldman, thanks so much for being a guest. Thanks so much, Ethan. Thank you so much to Jeff Waldman for being a guest on the show today. And thank you so much to Fotile for sponsoring this episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast. You can find the YouTube video that Jeff and I talked about, photos of some of the structures that Jeff has designed and sells plans for, and a complete transcript over at thetinyhouse.net slash 271. You'll also find the links to Fotile and more info about the two-in-one dishwasher on the show notes page as well. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.